I'm Debbie Lee, the Festival Director of Melbourne Jewish Book Week. Thank you for joining us today. We are here to interview the wonderful Anne Seba, uh, a biographer from the UK who is gracing our shores. And I'm very excited to be having a discussion with Anne about her life as a writer and her subject matter. Before we uh, keep going, I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, on whose land we actually exist, the Melbourne Jewish Book Week is based. And I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. So without further ado, I am here with Anne Seba, as I mentioned, all the way from the UK. And is, I believe, still a senior research fellow with the Institute of Historical Research, formerly a Reuters correspondent and a distinguished biographer, mostly of iconic women, a litany of nonfiction books and, and a constant writer, from what I gather, um, people such as Laura Ashley, Jenny Churchill, the, the American mother of Winston Churchill, um, Mother Teresa, and of course, Wallace Simpson, a book entitled That Woman, which I think really captures the sentiment of the, the times. Um, and of course, the current book or the, the most recent publication, Ethel Rosenberg, the subtitle of which, The Short Life and Great Betrayal of an American Wife and Mother. So Anne, uh, I'd love to start talking with you more about your life as a writer, seeing as this is part of the series Writing Lives. I'd love to understand what inspired you to become a writer in the first place? Gosh, well, as an interviewer for my books, as a researcher, I love interviewing old people because if they do still have a clear memory, they often remember what they did when they were 17, 18, 19, those crucial years when you leave school and become an adult somehow seem to be um, very deeply um, sunk into the psyche of people I interview. So the other side of that is that I'm also aware that you tend to have told this story several times before and you impose a narrative arc on that. So again, I'm very aware that the job of a biographer really is to strip away those accretions and try and get back to the real truth, if there is such a thing as a subjective truth, because there isn't actually, you know, there are many versions of the truth. So all of that is a long preamble since you asked about me, which I'm very flattered to be asked about. And I just want to say I'm thrilled to be here. I love Australia. It's now my fourth, fifth visit. I've done three of these lecture tours. We might come on to that. But um, so you asked about me, what made me a writer? I am very conscious that you've told this story before and it tends to be a rigid version of the truth. And I always try and get away from that a little bit. But on the other hand, there is a very clear moment. I can remember when I was a child, I always wanted to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I know that because my parents reminded me that when I was eight or nine, they bought me a plastic toy typewriter and I started writing a local newspaper. So there has been a very definite moment when I wanted to be a journalist. I read history at university. I went to King's College in London. And when I was asked what I wanted to do by my professor and said, oh, I'm going to be a foreign correspondent. I'm going to report wars. He said, well, what have you done so far? So he pushed me across the road to Bush House, the world service of the BBC. He said, well, get yourself a job. So my first job actually was in the Arabic service of the BBC. I didn't speak a word of Arabic, but that didn't matter. I was a dog's body. To have BBC on your CV was wonderful, as they knew. And then I walked down the road to Fleet Street, not quite walked down the road. I applied to join Reuters, but it is just down the road. And I was the first woman that Reuters took on their graduate trainee scheme to be a foreign correspondent. I mean, what an extraordinary privilege. They obviously just decided, well, you know, it's time to take on a woman. So we will take Anne. She's come to us. I, I joined speaking French, German and Russian, hoping to report from Moscow or something thrilling. And yeah. they decided that, oh, no, woman, we've got to send her to Italy. And I said, but I don't speak Italian. 
<laughs> so they taught me Italian and I went to Rome and it was wonderful. And I had six years at Reuters. And then I have the dubious honor of being the first woman that Reuters sacked when I got pregnant because they said, you can't be a foreign correspondent and a mother. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought my world was over, but we went to live in New York with a baby. And that's when I started writing books. And actually I've had a fantastic life because I'm lucky to have three children and 11, 12 books. And it isn't quite the foreign correspondent reporting from dangerous war zones. I've had to force myself to take myself off to dangerous places, so-called, um, and construct my own writing life. Mm -hmm. But I learned that discipline from Reuters and I feel very lucky that I was taught how to do it. And now I make up my own rules, but what a fantastic life and a privilege to go to places under the name of research, you know, from <laughs> India, which we may talk about, or, or Mexico or wherever the research yeah. has taken me. So that's How exciting. Do you think that your experience as the only woman on the um, staff within the Reuters community when you first started actually influenced your decision to write predominantly about women? Do you, or do you think um, growing up in that sort of feminist era might have had an influence, the fact that you, you know, down the track, had to be dismissed because you became pregnant all of those things I mean I'm I'm sensing a strong a strong sort of uh cause a feminist cause in a sense without being militant <laughs> yeah you know we're we're all feminists nobody would yeah. say they're not feminists of course I am um I don't think I was an activist or a militant but uh, you know, I, I struggled at one point, I have to say, when Reuters, quote unquote, let me go and I had to pay back my maternity leave. My son's 46. In those days, you know, they could do it and they could say things like, but, you know, you've got a husband and why do you need to work? Why do you need to work? Yeah. It, it It is another era. I remember walking into the newsroom in Fleet Street and people would wolf whistles, con comments on your makeup hair. And I wasn't really um, able to deal with that in in a in the way I would now, you know, slap somebody <laughs> or slap them with a lawsuit or or whatever. I just thought, you know, there were many women in media of my era who just said, "Well, that was how it was. You took it in your stride and tried to create your own path." And I absolutely did. And truth is, I so loved what I was doing that I didn't really want to cause ripples, but I was upset. I, I thought I would never work again. Luckily, being in New York, my first biography was about a woman called Enid Bagnold, and she died just as I was coming back. So I knew all her papers would be there. And Enid Bagnold's husband was a man called Sir Roderick Jones who ran Reuters. So I was really pleased I hadn't sued them because I had access to this fantastic archive. And Enid Bagnold, who, if anyone doesn't know, she wrote The Chalk Garden and extraordinary book, National Velvet, which starred Elizabeth Taylor. And it's a really feminist story of a woman, a child, a girl. Yeah. Um, we're not allowed to call them girls, certainly, but it was a girl um, who pretended she was a boy and won the Grand National. And there wasn't a real woman who won, the, a, a female jockey, winning the Grand National until a couple of years ago. So... Yeah. I learned quite a lot of quiet feminism from Enid yeah. because her play, The Chalk Garden, there are no men in it. She was the breadwinner in the family when her husband was sacked. And 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 slowly there's this sort of accretion. And you, I, you know, I haven't needed to be aggressive, but my path, uh, uh, an aggressive feminist, but how could you not be? I've got two daughters. You know, I see a completely different world now. Um, where life isn't straightforward, of course, but but that particular battle, I think, still has to be fought. But it's it 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 they they've moved several notches down the road. So you ask why I've written only about women. So that was my first book, and once you have a first book, actually there was one before, so it was my second book, but it was my first real book, and you know then you can have an agent and you're sort of on the path. And when I said after 
three books about women. I really like, I, I didn't want this narrowing that I saw in front of me. Now, of course, there's a different battle. You can only write about your own lived experience. So I can only write about women like me, but we yeah. may get onto that. Um, so I tried to write about a man, an 18th century, um, 18th, 19th century man called William Banks, who owned a fantastic National Trust House in Dorset called Kingston Lacey. And um, he was exiled. The book is called The Exiled Collector because um, he, he was found in a compromising situation. But that book, and, and the reason I'm talking about it is because um, partly it's led me into this path of lecturing because he had he was a great collector and yeah. the house is, is a gem. But also I had to leave my agent and my publisher to do it because I was considered somebody who wrote about women. It wasn't that they mm. didn't want, it, it, it wasn't that I was forbidden from writing about men. I'm afraid it's called branding, you exactly. know, and people go now to a bookshop. I hope it doesn't sound immodest to say so. And they see a book by Anne Seba and they sort of know that it'll be a 20th century iconic woman. Yes. And I'm actually perfectly happy because that's, precisely the field I like writing in but if I think would I like to write about a 18th century 19th century man I couldn't do that now no publisher would consider that that's a book by Anne Sever that they could publish so the field has narrowed yes it's rather delimiting and it's sort of interesting how mm. all can get pigeonholed even when they've proven themselves and they've got the rungs on the board and the foundations to it literally springboard into any area because you're you're so incredibly accomplished as an author but um it's also the area that obviously you enjoy and there's so much content there's so many mm. you know, different subject areas that you could talk about so many different women that you can um bring to exactly. life exactly and, no, and so it, 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 it hasn't bothered me at all because no. it's precisely the area I want to write about. On yeah. the other hand, you know, if I wrote fiction, I would fight to the death for the right of any novelist to write about any subject they like, because that's what we do. We imagine ourselves into the skin of somebody else. But perhaps as a biographer, it's slightly different. And what is your lived experience makes it easier to understand it. It, it narrows the field, but on the other hand, um, I still think it's it's a rich field. Absolutely. There's never-ending opportunities. And one of the things that you touched on earlier, even when you talked about the Bagnold, uh, was it Bagnold that you talked about? No, Banks, uh, the, the male, the, the 18th century, but... William Banks, yeah. William Banks. When you actually did mention that you do like to write about, um, you know, people who still have living contacts that you can draw on in the research mm. side of things. So I think that's an interesting aspect. And I really felt that let's get on to Ethel Rosenberg, the book that was published in 2021. So I think that is your most recent. Um, but I do feel that the richness of the content was absolutely emboldened by the fact that you actually were able to talk to many people who still lived when you were writing the book. People like Elizabeth Phillips, the child psychologist. So I want to, let's just start with, with Ethel as a woman, as a rather, I mean, she was born pretty much into poverty. She was a first generation immigrant, a child of yep. Russian parents. Um, it's an interesting time in New York, I guess, but it was also coming out of the, well, she grew up through the depression and then into the Second World War, and she was incredibly intelligent, but it didn't matter. She was still a girl. She was taken out of school at 15 so that the focus could be on the boy's education, her, her brother's education. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience of Ethel as a young girl when she first, you know, sort of, you know, was... was oh, yes. Thank her you for asking because <laughs> I think it's so interesting. She was born in 1915, as, as you rightly say, to the child of, of immigrants, both her parents spoke Yiddish. So mm -hmm. she was the interpreter for them. Her father was um, ran a repair shop in Sheriff Street on the Lower East Side and by all accounts was very sweet, introduced Ethel to Yiddish theatre, but not very ambitious. Her mother, Tessie, 
um, who married Barney when he already had one child, the first wife died. So she took on a son. Ethel was her firstborn, the only girl. And then there were two boys after that. And boys were the only thing that mattered, according to Tessie. I think Tessie probably was bright, but didn't speak English and was jealous of Ethel, who was extremely bright. And the two boys weren't. So there was no love, no care. She, she, you know, women just weren't cherished. I think that's the word I would use. Whereas David, after several miscarriages, was the younger son, chubby cheek, curly haired, rather sweet as a little boy, but failed all his exams. And so oh, was a very good mother. Um, I mean, mother in the sense she was a sister, but she mothered her younger brother. That was expected of her. Yeah. She was expected when she finally left school to contribute part of her wages. So just mm -hmm. to go back to her school, because I think her youth is important. And yeah. she was 37 when she was killed. So, you know, one has to focus on what, what made her. And that's what my book is all about. I, I wanted to extrapolate Ethel. I didn't want to tell the same old tired spy story of course it's set against the background of the cold war but it it's much it was much more important for me to understand who who ethel was and what made her so robust in in her isolation she skipped a year at school so she could have gone to college college or university as we call it a free university was just becoming available to to girls and that was what she always hoped. So having skipped a year, she did not want to follow the traditional path of, of doing some kind of secretarial work. But mm. it was made clear to her when she graduated in 1931, and she was only 15, that she had to do um, a stenographer's course. And she didn't begrudge it. She did it willingly and got a job in um, a packing company and gave some of her wages to her mother and continued to help with all the household chores. But it was against the background of the depression. So she saw people thrown out of their houses. She saw that capitalism wasn't working and thought there must be a better way. And all of that played into the fact that she had to get a job. So I learned two things about her during this critical time from 15 onwards until she married Julius Rosenberg. So Ethel Greenglass led a strike at the packing company and she was quite a timid girl at school, but nonetheless, she found her voice in, in social activism. And she led this strike and she lay on the road on her railway, on her raincoat, preventing lorries from coming in to, to deliver. And her wages were deducted for um, several weeks. Mm -hmm. And at the end, the newly founded National Labour Relations Board was set up to look into her case. And they found that actually she'd been justified and she was exonerated at this point and her money was repaid her. So that was yes. a huge triumph. You mentioned that I met people who knew Ethel. So important to me, and I'd like to come back to that afterwards. Yeah. But one of these was a woman called Miriam Moskovitz, oh, who yeah. I met when she was 99. And Miriam had been in prison with Ethel in the Women's House of Detention. And she said to me that this triumph of the strike, of realising she could make a difference for people who had almost nothing, was something that really played into her psyche. And she wanted to live by, by those mm. rules or, or those beliefs, rather. The other thing I learned about Ethel's teenage years is that she was a very talented, almost self-taught musician. So she sang at school and I met some of the children of her classmates who told me that Ethel singing and acting, she was considered the class actress. Again, you have this sort of shy person who becomes the all-American teenager. She goes to this fantastic public school, um, Seward High, and she walks in and there's this theater and assembly hall and she's able to leave behind the poverty and the petty mindedness of her parents and their ilk and assume these grand characters. I should think she wasn't terribly good at acting. She probably hammed it up, but she was good at singing. So yeah. good that um, 
she joined a, an amateur dramatics group and they encouraged her to apply to join a choir. Now, most people would join any old Lower East Side choir, but not Ethel. She decided she had to go to the very best. This is typical of her sort of mildly obsessive character. She went to Carnegie Hall and she joined or applied to join the Schola Cantorum. She was rejected because she couldn't do sight singing. So what does she do instead of just saying, okay, well, you know, that's how it is. She finds a piano that's on the street because people are throwing pianos out in the depression. They need the floor space to take in people for extra rent, extra money, however you can get it. And she teaches herself sight singing. And a year later, she goes back and reapplies. And this time she's taken on. Now, to be taken on by this fantastically high caliber Scuola Cantorum was a big success in Ethel's development. And, and I know that it meant a lot to her because when she was tried, she tells, it's one of the few stories she tells in court about how at 19, she was the youngest member of the Scuola Cantorum and they're playing avant-garde Russian music and they're having emigre conductors like Toscanini. This just blew her mind clearly. Why did she leave after a year? I think because they were going on tour and she had to give some money to her mother. She wouldn't have been allowed. So, you know, she does what she's told. She's an obedient daughter. She gets, um, a, she, she does the stenographer's course. She doesn't go to college like some of her classmates. And yet she has this amateur dramatic play acting um, that she does in the evening and the singing as well. So, She's mm. aiming to somehow break free of this narrow social group that her parents represent. And then she meets Julius Rosenberg. Yes, so Another I did want to ask you about that. That's the, that's the natural trajectory. I feel that, and the, the way you you tell the story, it's it's so moving and you feel her her sort of striving to break free she really does and nothing sets her back you know that determination to as you say go to the audition at Carnegie Hall get rejected find the piano set it up in a bedroom teach herself sight music go go again to Carnegie Hall break through but then having to give that up and give most of her money to her mother, who was not grateful from the sounds of it and really did put her down a lot. And despite all of that, she was a plain young thing, but she still had this sort of inner confidence, obviously, to to act and to sing. A lot of people would be terribly in, inhibited. Um, and, you know, and the fact that she led the union strike, I think that was, as you say, completely pivotal in her development. And then meeting Julius, my sense was, Julius was immediately attracted to her intellect, um, you know, her achievements, but uh, also the fact that she hadn't had any real love in her life meant that that and that the immediacy of their relationship could really sort of take take shape. Is would you? suggest all, that all of that yes gosh thank you for such a close reading of my book I'm very very flattered um Julius it should be said because the judge rammed it down everyone's throats was two and a half years younger yes. but it clearly was a physical sexual relationship I think uh, possibly neither of them had had serious relationships before they met at a fundraising gala um Again, I don't want to skate over the fact that this is 1936, which for me is a pivotal year. I mean, you we've talked about the fact that I write about women. I think the thread in my work is actually 1936. For me, that is the year Hitler marched into the Rhineland. Nobody stopped him. That was the year he could have been stopped. What were we doing in England? Faffing around worried about a king and his morals. So, you know, mm. that's my book on Wallace, really centres around 1936. In France, you have a communist popular front party led by Léon Blum. I've always been fascinated by France in, the 90, in, in 1936 and why that didn't last. In Spain, you have the Spanish Civil War, again, a pivotal moment in world history. So, um, back to Ethel and Julius, they're collecting for Spanish war orphans. Several of their friends go off to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. And Ethel is singing at a gala for um, 
orphans of the Spanish Civil War. Again, something that the judge uses against her because she's got a collecting tin in her hallway for these orphans. I mean, it is staggering me the way these, these things were, were used subsequently. So she's singing at this gala and she's a bit nervous that night. And, and Julius, although younger, is able, he was obviously a charmer and a talker, but didn't see things through. And, and he talked her through it and calmed her nerves and she sang and they were an item ever since. But although both parents were happy for the wedding, um, I think the Greenglass family had an element that they thought, huh, what's Ethel doing? You know, stepping out of her social circle. She's worried about Russian problems, the Russian peasants, and she sings Italian arias. Why can't she just concentrate on her elderly parents at home? They thought she was getting above herself by singing and by marrying Julius Rosenberg. Now, the Rosenbergs were hardly a step up in the social ladder, but they were a tiny notch up because Julius was a college educated man. Yeah. He he didn't pass first time. And you talk about the piano in the bedroom. I mean, actually Ethel poached Julius to get through his final exam. So there is a sense because of that, people again use that against Ethel. They say, well, she was obviously the, the master in this relationship. She was the one who drove it. She just wanted to get married and they couldn't get married till Julius passed his exam. So she was clever, but, but there was this real fear of, oh, she's a clever woman. She's too clever by half. And that was in her own family and in the courtroom. And you can see how these little stories somehow came to haunt her subsequently. And yet she had subjugated all of her desires in order to be the dutiful wife and then became the mother. And that was her entire focus. Um, she gave up her job when Julius was, I think, got a, got a position in a different location and she had to forfeit her, her yes. job. And she was earning more money than him, but that didn't matter. So, you know, it's very interesting how that conditioning, I guess, of, of women, and I still think it's probably partly the case today to some extent because of, you know, the fact of child rearing, but she was very, very dedicated no matter what her her situation was, she threw herself in 100%. So 100% behind Julius, 100% into motherhood. And, of course, that was, I guess, when the Cold War was really starting to rear its head. Post, when were the when was Michael born? Because she had her children um, four years apart, I believe. No, yeah, something like that. But when was Julie, when was... Michael Ma was born in, in 43, Okay, so that um, was still during the war. Yes. Yeah. When Russia was an ally or had become was becoming an ally because it, Yes, of, Russia was yeah. an ally in 41. So lots of things you've yeah. touched on. And and I agree with you. It's so sad actually that she was accused of of the reverse of what she was. She mm. really tried hard to be a good mother. That's what she wanted most of all. And not just to be a good mother, but as I said before, obsessive to be the best mother in the world and better than her own mother. So she went to mothering classes, not just any mothering classes, but she found a Viennese emigre called Edith Buxbaum. And she went to music classes so she could teach Michael the guitar, which he still plays. So it obviously worked. Those early years of mothering were, were key. Yeah. Um, so what was the question? <laughs> so, so I guess it was really about how she subjugated all of her desires and she mm. became mother she threw herself into it and then she's still um you know vilified regardless of what she did yes especially yes. Oh, but you were also talking about russia which of course is yes. key so at the time they became communists which i'm i'm sure they did although no part has ever been found but you know they were obviously communist believers from 1936. Well, being a communist in 1936 was a completely different thing. People who talk about communism today um, can't really com com compute it with what it meant in 36. For Ethel, it was partly because this was the only way to stop the dictators, not just Hitler, but Mussolini and Franco. 
Um, but also she had seen such hardships. So it was a social communism as well. She believed capitalism had failed and this was a way forward. So I, yeah. I'm not in any doubt they were communists, but once war was declared in 39 and the molotov ribbentrop between Germany and the Soviet Union, it was very awkward to be a communist. And a lot of people left the Communist Party at that point. So here's the first criticism of Ethel and Julius. Why didn't they abandon it if they want to stop Hitler? Suddenly he's made a pact with the Soviet Union. Well, they still believe that communism had a role as, as a social force. You can criticize them, that's fine, but they stayed hoping it would all come, come good. And in fact, it did come good in 1941 when Hitler marches into Russia, Soviet Union, and then pact is broken and suddenly Soviet Union becomes an ally of America. And that's the point where the American government has to, you know, there's this yo-yoing, if you like, a vault fast, having told American citizens, oh, Russian communism is very dangerous, they're our enemies and we're not going to go down that route. Suddenly, here are the brave Russian forces who are not just fighting our battle, they're fighting the really terrible, appalling battles with enormous courage mm. and ferocity. So there are a lot of um, propaganda films, there are rallies to try and explain to the American pub public, you know, we, we told you the Russians were our enemies and now they're our friends and this is why. So it was at one of these rallies that Julius made himself known to the Russian authorities and said, I'm working for a government organization and I think I can help you. And what's more, several of my friends, he graduated as an engineer. He wasn't called up because he had asthma and poor eyesight and he was in a restricted occupation. Now, I am in no way justifying that it was in Julius's gift to mm. give information to even to an ally. Of course, it's not. You know, you. Uh, on the other hand, you have to understand as a biographer what motivated him. So I'm explaining. Mm. At no point is there any evidence that Ethel was involved in this at all. However, I'm quite sure she approved. I'm quite sure she knew. But freedom of thought is entrenched in the American Constitution. So that's not a crime. The only crime of which Ethel was accused when they were both picked up and charged with conspiracy to commit espionage, they had to find an overt act because the charge of conspiracy is woolly. Of course, as a married couple, they discussed things. Of course, living in such a cramped, tiny flat where they didn't even have their own bedroom. That was given to the children. They had a pull-down bed in the other room. Of course she knew, of course she approved, but there is no evidence of any overt act. And that's when her brother, this chubby cheek, curly-haired boy I mentioned, David, who was seven years younger, David was at Los Alamos. Now, anyone who's seen the Oppenheimer film will be in no doubt what um, was going on at Los Alamos. They were building nuclear weapons, the Manhattan Project. So the fact that Ethel had a brother there who was a spy, he was passing on information, um, they immediately linked back. And, and there was documentation proving that Julius was some kind of spy ring recruiter. And the evidence hinged on what was the overt act that Ethel had performed. Now, the reason that the American authorities needed this overt act was because Julius refused to admit anything. Okay. And they thought, oh, Julius knows all these people. Why won't he talk? But he wouldn't. So they arrested Ethel as well as a lever to put pressure on Julius. Although the American authorities knew all along there was no evidence against Ethel, so they had to invent some. And that's the desperate cruelty at the heart of this story. It's absolutely devastating. And the fact that David and his wife, Ruth, actually perjured themselves and created a story about Ethel having typed up some secret information that David had taken from Los Alamos, I believe, if I'm re recalling the, the sequence of events, 
but they actually created a story. And that's where I think the, um, you know, Judge Kaufman really nailed Ethel based on a complete fabrication. And what I find intriguing also, something that you just touched on, is the fact that Julius wouldn't actually break even to save his own wife's life. That part I also find quite intriguing. Um, and the fact that Ethel remained so incredibly devoted to Julius, never resentful, I mean, with all of her time in prison, in solitary confinement for two thirds of it, and I think she was in prison for three years before she was finally yeah. executed, she never actually analysed it to the point where Julius was uh, responsible for her predicament. She never, you know, decided that he he actually caused all of this. How do you uh, reconcile that? Well, there's there's a lot to say. Um, I would say that Julius, in a way, was naive. He didn't know there was any evidence against him, so he thought that probably he could bluff it. So you can blame Julius, I think, to an extent. But And then think they were never allowed to touch, let alone speak, so they couldn't have any kind of coordinated defence. But I think they concluded, or, or let's focus on what Ethel concluded. What what could Julius do? Could he say, oh, look, it was me, leave my wife out of it? He he was saying it wasn't either of us, not, neither had done anything. Mm -hmm. So what could Ethel do in those circumstances? Could she shop her husband? Could she say, look, actually, Julius did help a bit to find people who were willing to pass things on, but it's not me. She arguably could have done that. I think they concluded there was no guarantee that that would get them off at all. Even David, who did a plea bargain, so his wife wasn't even indicted at all, and they were spies and there was evidence against them. So Ruth was able to stay behind at home with the two children. David, in the end, got nine and a half years. So Ethel might have had a custodial sentence. I mean, how foolish of the government not to give her a custodial sentence. We wouldn't be talking about this now. Yeah. But Ethel figured if they give me nine, 10 years, my kids will be grown up by the time I come out. And first of all, I'll have missed those crucial 10 years. But worse, I'll be blamed for my husband's death. And she could never live with herself under those circumstances. And she concluded my sons won't be able to live with me for having killed their father. And I can absolutely see that. She felt she had no choice at all. They either lived together or, or died together. And I think she was right. And she concluded, I've got no material possessions. I can leave my sons. What can I leave them? Just a legacy of loyalty, which she set against the green glasses legacy of betrayal. At, at every stage, she felt the green glasses had betrayed them. And I think if you meet Ethel and Julius's two sons, who are retired college professors in their 80s, and they're just the most lovely people, you would reckon that she did the right thing at, at obviously, enormous cost, her own life. You know, the only woman killed for a crime other than murder in the US. And... Uh, to put to death a 37-year-old mother of two young children who were six and four with no evidence against her, and the government knew that, is the more I live with this story, the more shocking it is to see that a government can cave in to hysteria, to yeah. mob rule, really. It's when a government no longer takes the uh, rule of law seriously. I mean, this... I, I see Ethel as a brave woman tarnished by the times. Mm -hmm. You can say she was wrong, but but she was courageous and she felt she was living for a, a moral code, a moral value. But but for a country to sell its citizens down the river Absolutely. for no good reason is is the most That's shocking aspect of it. Yeah, it was almost like there was this um, decision to drive fear in order to retain power. And what do you do with a problem like Ethel Rosenberg? You have to 
hide her away, get rid of her because it's too much of an admission to sort of say we've created this situation because we thought we'd get the the dirt from Julius by imprisoning his wife, it's backfired, so we have to make her the villain. And that's how it plays out in the way I interpreted no. what you're writing. Certainly, no, you're right, because they had to convince the American public that she was wicked and evil. And so by the time of her execution, 70% of American people thought that she was guilty. Mm. But there's no evidence other than the fact that she was older, that she was frumpy, that she didn't cry in court. Yes. All of those things were used against her. She's obviously a new breed of clever women. We've won World War II. We're in danger of losing the peace if we allow these wicked women to become so powerful. It's, it's such a desperately sad story. And, uh, you know, my book is about her. It is about a woman, but it's actually about the rule of law. Yes. It's really in what's at the heart of it, that this great democracy, I mean, I've lived in America and I love it, but for a moment, it's, it's mind, I think, to, yeah. to allow the, the rule of law to be overlooked. Even Eleanor Roosevelt at one point, I mean, this sort of strong pioneering feminist who was against the death penalty actually said, I don't support the death penalty, but I cannot fight against the rule of law. And if that is Ethel Rosenberg's um, sentence, she couldn't. She felt powerless in terms of actually, you know, trying to do That's, something to, to stop it. David so, had lied. David yes. had said, I saw my sister type up these notes. That yes. was the overt act they needed. And when he came out of prison, he said, of course, I didn't see my sister. I can't even remember. He said, uh, mm. did my wife type up the notes? Maybe nobody did. But he said, you know, that's what my wife said. I sleep with my wife, not my sister. He said, my sister was stupid. She could have told, she could have named names. I'm not sure she could have named names. Mm. But, but uh, did he wait until Ruth died before he actually said, no, she didn't type the notes? Or if I well, he did this 60 minutes program. No, yeah, he said when he came later. out of prison. <laughs> That's um, right. No, That's right. Yeah. Can I ask you, with um, Stalin becoming more and more radical and obviously becoming a tyrannical dictator further on, post the, the Allies stage and into the Cold War stage, mm. why did so many people like Ethel and Julius continue to support the communist cause? Why were they impervious to what was actually happening in Russia? Oh, I can't speak for people generally, and we don't know what Ethel and Julius would have done. A lot of people left the Communist Party at various points along the way, many in 1956 or 68. And as for those who stayed in the Communist Party, honestly, it's not for, for me to judge them. You can say they're foolish, they're stupid, they're naive, they're stuck in a groove. They didn't want to see everything they'd stake their lives on Um set at naught uh, you know I know I know what I think I would have done if I'd been in possession of the facts I, I can't justify it but I'm really only able to talk about Ethel and Julius and since they were killed in 1953 um, they didn't have work. a chance to row back yeah that's what I think and also the idealism the the pursuit of um, eradicating poverty and inequality and racism mm. and all these ideals of of what they saw communism standing for, I think, is you know totally understandable. And as you say, very difficult to sort of reconcile that with what, even if they knew, and they possibly quite probably didn't know what was actually occurring. Um, so we will we'll forgive. Well, you can them. say they should have done. Listen, I'm not going to justify no. Stalin and no. and his murderous policies. That's that's absolutely just not my brief, and it's not what no. this book is about. So, and the other um, thing, is that know, the other side of it, you've got McCarthyism, which is all about driving fear, and it's political. And I I am interested in the American sort of psyche at the time, as you mentioned, the fact that yeah. 70% of the population were actually of the view that Ethel Rosenberg was guilty as charged, and yet it was a fabrication. There was a lot of, uh, you know, there were a lot of supporters. I think uh, J. Edgar Hoover received three million letters before he actually finished his term, and the um, 
it, 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 Eisenhower took over a Republican taking on from the Democrat. My, I also understood from what you wrote that Hoover didn't want to take the action. He didn't want to have blood on his hands. So he kind of yeah. put things on hold until he could hand over the problem. And then Eisenhower went sort of hell for leather. And the other Machiavellian element was uh, Judge Kaufman, Kaufman. So, you know, yeah. and but, but, but the, the, you know, to, to well. go back to Hoover, in the end, Hoover did, as you say, did not want Ethel killed. I think that's okay. really the essence of it. And I don't want to downplay the reality of the fear. I've I've spoken to enough people who really were scared that once Russia exploded a bomb, they realized there must be some American um people of knowledge from America, American spies giving information. They uh, they were terrified that with China going communist and in when when Russia exploded a bomb in Kazakhstan and then the Korean War when North Korea attacked South Korea, that suddenly they'd lost so many lives in World War II and here was communism triumphing. So I, I absolutely understand the reality of, of the fear that there would be a, a World War III. On mm. the other hand, Ethel was used as a scapegoat for that. And, and that's really what I'm trying to look at, why there are other ways that you can deal with, with a real existential fear, but you don't subvert the rule of law for a country that's trying to stand up as a great democratic example against totalitarianism mm -hmm. and i'm i'm not soft on totalitarianism i'm i'm really not i'm just saying look at the price this woman paid yes for the fear of the american government and and it just doesn't tally and do you think that you know as we sort of look back in time with the benefit of hindsight that there is a totally new understanding of who Ethel Rosenberg was, this incredibly brave, proud, dignified woman. So what was almost decried as, as um, you know, wicked because she was so strong and refused to show her, her inner emotions, she she sort of entered court with this air of dignity and she held her head up as she even as she sat in the electric chair. I think, you know, it sends shivers down your spine, literally, when you think about what it must have taken, her inner resolve, each time she met with the children and there were so precious, you know, seldom times that she was able to meet with them in Sing Sing in the prison, where, as I mentioned, she was she was in solitary confinement, but ironically, Julius wasn't because there were other men on death row, but there were no other women on death row. Yes. And she has, I mean, I also found that I don't even know what my question is because I'm so overwhelmed with how much you pack into this remarkable book. Um, the, the relationships she did develop, each of them so profound, everybody that she she met developed this kind of admiration for her, it seems, in prison. And that uh, of the one thing that I really did uh, find fascinating was how she fell in love with her psychiatrist, Saul Miller, because he was the only man that she could see, I guess. Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of no, the the um, analysis she had is very interesting. I think she'd have probably become a psychoanalyst, but yes. only through speaking to Betty Miller, who was the child psychiatrist, who had such a clear view of Ethel's intelligence and how she viewed her own situation but your question at the beginning was do I feel that the situation that the understanding of Ethel has changed mm -hmm. and sadly I don't actually I think some people see her differently but um, that's all I'm trying to do to tell a story and understand but I think there are some people who persist in seeing Putin's Russia, as Stalin's Russia. And as a historian, of course, I can't agree with that because it's a discrete period. And I think you absolutely must see it in the context of the 1930s and the limited education that Ethel had had, but mostly in the context of the 1930s and what it meant to be a communist then. Of course, I'm not writing a book saying that Putin's Russia is great, but there are some people who believe that anyone who has any sympathy for Russia 
um, mm. deserves to be killed. So, you know, I can't, I can't honestly hand on heart say um, that everybody now thinks we should have sympathy for Ethel. My view is America should surely have stood for the rule of law. And mm. that's what I find so sad because Eisenhower, who was a strong war leader, felt he needed to show strength in the face of this new communist threat. And even though he knew that he couldn't produce evidence against Ethel, she needed to die. Wouldn't he have been so much stronger if he'd said, actually, Ethel, you can go to prison for 10 years, 20 years, whatever it was. Yeah. As I say, there wouldn't be this story that I'm telling you now. It was really so weak to decide she had to be killed. And and that's really, uh, you know, I, I want to keep it in the context of 1936, because I think that's important historically. But not everybody will feel sympathy for her. They mm. just feel that because Russia is a country we don't like today. Oh, well, you know, it's, it was the same then. And it, it, yeah, it's a different it's story. But, you know, the, the other sort of analogous uh, uh, people that at the same time were having, going through court, such as Morton Sobel and David Greenglass himself, that were given much lighter sentences but actually confessed. Mm. Was it the fact that there was no confession that gave that meant that they were executed, both Julius and Ethel? Is that? No, it, it was because Morton Sobel could, could not, um, there was no proof that he'd been involved in atomic um, right. espionage. So it was military and industrial. Now, there's a lot of evidence that indicates Julius was only, I say advisedly, passing on military and industrial secrets and mm -hmm. not atomic. But it was this enormous fear of atomic um, yes. espionage. And clearly there were leaks. I mean, the, the number one, um, leak came from a man called Klaus Fuchs, who was an East German who'd gone to England, and the British had sent him to Los Alamos in their delegation. Now, the British were had a completely different response to this, partly embarrassment that they'd sent this obvious communist sympathiser from um, Eastern Europe to work um, as part of their team. He was a brilliant physicist, and he passed really important information on he was given the maximum term for a term for espionage in England, which is 14 years. And after serving 10, um, he, he was freed. Uh, it was clear had they confessed. Who knows? I think Julius and Ethel believed that why should they put their friends through what they'd been through? But you know, but Russia was an that. ally. Yes. So, exactly. However misguided... They they just believed that probably by standing together and not naming names, that was taking the high moral ground. Yes, and the crime that they purportedly did, well, that Julius did commit, was in 1944 at the time of Russia being an ally, and yet they were tried mm. in sort of 1950 to 1953 when things had changed. So there was no sort yeah. of retrospective, um, you know, recognition of that that it, it didn't actually align it's very interesting and I think the fact that you know Ethel was so incredibly dedicated to her cause of of wife and mother all the way through and she maintained that and as you say her children Michael and Robbie have ended up being quite you know incredibly well balanced and incredibly successful especially given that terrible childhood where they were carted between I guess, you know, foster care as well as, you know, the grandmother that didn't really want them and the other grandmother that wasn't healthy enough to look after them. And then what I another thing that I loved was the fact that they ended up being adopted by the mirror poles. And um, I think that must have been an incredibly stabilising force. And they were always, I believe, loyal to Ethel. Um, and so they could put most probably provide a, a, an assurance to the children that their mother absolutely adored them and they would have had that constant reinforcement. Hopefully that's what got them through to some extent. But the Mirapoles themselves are just a little sideline. I loved that little interlude that Abel Mirapol wrote uh, Strange Fruit, the the very, very moving, profound yep. song Billy Holiday sang so beautifully. I think, you know, that kind of 
sums up a lot of what this story is about. It's the pathos, it's the tragedy, it's the unfairness, it's the it's it's almost like good versus evil, um, you know, throughout. And when I think about Judge Kaufman versus little uh, Manny Block, who was hapless but tried his hardest mm. and just kept getting shut down. What, do you think there's, I mean, you know, I think there is a theme of anti-Semitism, but then you've got this sort of two very different Jewish uh, lawyers or, you know, a judge versus a lawyer. Um, it is literally, they were at odds. The judge was was so biased. How can that have been entertained in a court of law? Oh, well, you've touched on a lot of issues there. I, I agree. Manny Block is... It touches my heart and he was trying so hard when no other judge would take it on. He wanted to adopt the two boys but had a heart attack and that tells you how absolutely intense this was and he was out of his depth I'm, I'm sure but um, the Mirapoles that's a, a book on its own almost <laughs> talking about the Mirapoles I think they must have been saintly because after Ethel and Julius were killed, the government still hadn't had enough. They wanted to institutionalize the boys and the Mirapoles, who who must have been the most lovely couple because they took on disturbed boys who were a complete unit. And I think I admire them because they became their very beloved parents. Yes. They didn't either demonised Julius and Ethel, nor did they allow them to be turned into martyrs. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the the boys, as I call them, although, you know, they're men in their 80s now, were given this very difficult, fine line to tread that these are your parents who have given you life and you always respect the people who give you life. On the other hand, the Mirapoles brought them up and, and they were clever boys. I mean, they that helps, I think, to have a, a, a certain native intelligence. What was it like to meet them? It was wonderful. And I seen them quite recently. Michael's just turned 80. I wrote the book partly because it was lockdown and COVID on yeah. my own. I I'd, I'd met them a couple of times before I started. But they were wary of me because this story has been exploited by a lot of people. So partly they were wary and partly I wanted to retain my independence. I didn't want to write an authorised book and I didn't really know what I'd find. And I didn't know if I'd write a book that they were happy with. You know, what arrogance for this English woman to come and write a life of their mother. How could I ever manage that? I mean, but, you know, why would you want somebody you've never met to write a life of your mother when so many people have exploited the story? So I wrote it really in isolation, as I say, partly because it was COVID and lockdown and, and everything. But after they read it, I, I've established a much closer relationship and I've seen them. And um, Isn't that wonderful? Anyway. That's what you should hope. And that's what I guess, you know, it's a legacy to Ethel Rosenberg that you have that relationship that's ongoing. The book has been uh, endorsed and, and they're probably incredibly proud of the job that you have done because it is so meticulously researched. You've left no stone unturned. I can hardly wait for your next book. Can you tell us, because we were on the hour, what your next book is yes. about so that we have the anticipation <laughs> bubbling away? And when will it be? Uh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Well, everyone thought that I was writing about something quite dark with Ethel, which I was. The next one is darker. It's about the Women's Orchestra of Auschwitz. There was only one women's orchestra in all the camps and prisons and ghettos. And the main conductor was a woman called Alma Rosé, who was the niece of Gustav Mahler. And although she didn't survive, she was probably poisoned. All her charges, all the musicians were saved from being gassed. I say that because two of them died of typhus in Belsen at the end of the war. But mm. basically, Alma Rosé saved 40 or so musicians, some of them were as young as 14. They weren't really musicians at all. They had a couple of years playing the recorder. The Nazis insisted it was half Jewish, half Christian, but Alma went out of her way to save as many Jewish musicians as she possibly could. 
So that'll be published in spring 2025 for the 80th anniversary of the liberation of the camps. Oh, how fantastic. I hope you can come back and join us then and we will do a live event. <laughs> because Thank that you. Well, I'd love to. And so perfect for Melbourne Jewish Book Week, I must add. Um, and, you know, everything that you do is, is going to, um, you know, resonate. And I just think it's very exciting to have had you on this today. And we're very, very grateful for your time. So thank entirely you. my pleasure. It's I <laughs> who thank you for taking such an interest and close reading in my work. I'm I'm very touched. I learned thank a you. huge amount and I will be continuing to learn more and, you know, reading, watching movies and, and um, informing myself about this very interesting uh, time in, in our history. So again, thank you. Thank so you, Debbie. Bye now.